Hello, everyone. Hello, hello. How's everyone's day going? I see some folks that are joining us. Hello, Anna. Hi, everyone. We're just going to give it another minute and a half, um, just so that way we can get some additional folks here. And then we're going to go ahead and kick off the discussion today. Hello, Robin. I see your note in the chat. For the folks that just joined, hello. We're just going to give it another minute and we'll go ahead and get started. All right, well, it's 12.02. Lindsay, is there anyone else in the waiting room? Or are we set to get started? You are welcome to start. Okay, perfect. Well, we're going to start with introductions anyway. Um, so good to see you all. Hi, I'm Ashley Prelo. I'm the Assistant Vice President for Student Success, Thriving, and Retention. Um, I recognize some of the names here in this space, which are good to see, um, either some familiar names or some familiar faces. But for the folks that I have not had a chance to meet just yet, um, again, I introduced myself, but I did start in February of this year, and I've been really excited and committed to um, all things student success, which, as you can imagine, is everything under the umbrella on campus, um, and just trying to make sure that we coordinate, connect, and really try to leverage what we have and the great work that we're doing for our students to thrive on campus. Uh, before we dive in today, uh, into today's discussion. Um, I'm actually going to turn it over to uh, my other two co-presenters, uh, Jimmy and Michael, to introduce themselves. Hey, everybody. My name is Jimmy Ellis. I'm Associate Dean of Undergraduate Education. Uh, I work closely with our teams in you know, uh, first-year advising, AU experience, academic support, the assessment evaluation efforts we do in our office. And um, I report and our entire department uh, reports through uh, Dean Bridget Trogdon. Uh, Dean of Undergraduate Education, Academic Student Services. And I am Michael Brown. I'm the Associate Director of Student Success Operations. I've actually been here since August, so still a little new, but um, very excited about the initiative that we're going to be talking about today and in the future. So I'm looking forward to being able to have this discussion with everyone today. And thank you for having us. <laughs> Yes, thank you. Thank you both. And uh, again, it's so great to see some of the folks that just joined. We are just kicking off the presentation and discussion here today. And as you all can see, the focus is really on academic alerts and, and using them as a tool uh, for us to have more proactive outreach and intervention for our students to be successful at AU. And so some of the things that we want to make sure that we touch on during this discussion, just in terms of an agenda, um, or just to give you a sense of why is this important? You know, what is the purpose of this? How are we using this information? And what are academic alerts at its root? And, and, and how are we uh, working together to make sure that we're using this as a way for our students to um, feel like they're supported at the end of the day, right? That we understand that there's a number of different barriers that they're encountering throughout their experience. Um, some that are unexpected, right? And, and we need to make sure that we have the input and also uh, elevating their voice so that way we can best support them moving forward in order for them to persist and retain. Uh, we also wanna make sure that you all have a good sense of how to identify those types of students um, who may need an academic alert at any given point during the semester. Uh, we also want to give you all a sense of the process, right? Like what to expect in general, um, the technology behind it, just to give you a little bit of a peek behind the curtain um, so that you know how this information is funneling in and what it's being used for. And then of course, other resources, right? This is not the end all be all as it relates to our students and, and our support mechanisms for our students. And so we'll spend some time at the end just making sure you're aware of those resources. And obviously, you know, us, as we continue these conversations, we're gonna lean on your feedback beyond just individual students, right? It's about these processes. Um, so we want to consider you all as part of 
those resources for us to continue to improve as well. So let's go ahead and jump into the first slide here and, and, and really answer that question about the purpose and why uh, this academic alert uh, discussion today is so important. And the reason is to start retention, right? I think that this is a very obvious um, answer here, right? But to me, this is just one of the many pieces that equal student success, right? Like ultimately our outcome and how students should feel during and after their experience at AU is that they were able to thrive here, right? Like that is the ultimate goal. But in order for us to set these students up for success and making sure that they can take advantage of the full value proposition of what American University can offer is to retain those students. And this is where it becomes slightly operational, right? Now the thriving piece is again, the ultimate goal, but in order for us to track and get a sense of where our students are across their life cycle and their experience at AU, this is part of what we collect, right? We wanna make sure that they understand that promise, that we're enrolling students that, you know, obviously meet the, the criteria and go through the application process, show uh, the strong fit and inclination to persist at AU, um, but we also understand when it's not always a good fit, right? So we want to understand at the same time, while we're trying to retain students, why also some, and I really mean some, we retain the majority of our students at 86%, right? So just to put that in, in perspective, there are very few students that are actually leaving AU, but we still want to study and understand why that might be. And that includes before they actually leave the university. If they're already starting to feel that, we can actually start to think of ways to intervene to prevent that attrition. We wanna deliver the exact results that they're looking for. So for example, if they're struggling academically, we want to be able to work with them on academic coaching or supporting them throughout their experience. We also need to understand that while there are little or few amounts of students that leave, it's still 14%, right? And so that's significant. And we need to think about larger strategies outside of those intervention, those individual intervention strategies to organize us as a community and track constantly where our students are, whether they're at risk, areas of also celebration. We don't wanna leave you all with this being more of the stick than the carrot, right? Ultimately, we are here to support our students and we'll be able to see both the good, the bad, the medium, uh, right? And, and, and ways to really connect with our students where they are. And so for us to continue to do that, I want, I want to turn it over to Michael a bit to talk about how we as a community can coordinate around this retention effort. Thanks, Ashley. <clears throat> so I'll be talking about the ever evolving to a coordinated care model at AU. Um, you know, coordinated care or um, establishing a culture of care has definitely uh, been a hot topic within um, within higher education over these last few years um, because it is a huge um, it is a huge can either be a huge detriment or a huge um, opportunity uh, for an institution to really build what that looks like and tailor it um, to each student's individual need if possible. And so, what some of this looks like is. Um, is the people, right? And so leadership, advisors, administrators, faculty, student affairs, financial aid, admissions, career services, academic support, and more. All of these individuals are stakeholders within the student success model, right? And, and, and establishing this coordinated care. Um, and so we do like to put an emphasis on faculty because faculty spends a lot of time with students um, and, and pro possibly the most time with students, right? While they're here on campus. Um, and so that is such a huge opportunity opportunity for us to gather information on how we can care for our students even more closely and tailor it more closely to their individual needs. Um, as far as processes goes, um, coordinated communication, referrals such as the Eagle Eye referrals, uh, data sharing, process maps, standard operating procedures, and interventions. Um, these are these processes are fleshed out in many different ways. It looks different from coming from different departments depending on the intervention need. Um, so some of that may look like um, SAP, some of that may just look like back-end procedures that um, is more operational. 
Um, and then there's the technology that we leverage in order to help this coordinated care model along. So case management, academic alerts, which is what we're um, here to talk about today, uh, coordinated care dashboards, um, alternate communication channels, um, and artificial intelligence. AI is also, again, um, a very hot topic right now. Um, and it's something that we want to make sure that we're staying not only with the times, but ahead of the times and making sure that we're establishing the best possible technology on campus to help aid in these efforts. Um, and so those are just a few of uh, the items that we wanted to kind of go over regarding that coordinated care model at AU. But again, just keep in mind that it is ever evolving. Great, thank you, Michael. Um, wanna dive in now into the active alerts and before I get started, just wanna see a lot of familiar names. Good, good to see you on this call. Um, and also, I think we're in week seven of the uh, of the semester. I know that brings it up with some challenges. So hopefully we can um, uh, be here for you, give a little of space time, a little bit of clinical time together, and then learn a little bit about this process. Um, week seven is a unique period when it comes to academic alerts. And let me um, walk you through it. So um, when we think about academic alerts, uh, first and foremost, I want you to think about them as a student-centered tool for all instructors, okay? And so the point of an academic alert for us and the community has always been, it's supposed to be informational to students, it's supposed to be non-punitive, and it's a way for instructors to describe to students uh, in, a, in, a, in a communicated, connected way, um, concerns about attendance, performance, and engagement, things along those uh, dimensions. Um, you know, for us, you know, students come to AU with kind of high expectations of how they might perform, but the reality is, is that when we ask students about their experiences, especially early on as AU students, um, the reality is, is about half of our students are struggling at any time in a course, and, and in a reality, um, about 30% of students in the first year and beyond are struggling in two or more courses, and so um, this process of academic alerts, communication from faculty to students about, hey, I'm noticing that you're struggling, or I'm noticing some issues that could lead to struggle, is a way for us to normalize for students that, hey, this is normal, it's okay for me to notice, and it's okay for me to reach out to you, and then uh, give you um, uh, a nudge uh, to, to encourage you to either get in contact with me as a faculty member or with other resources um, with that possibility to improve. Important thing to know about academic alerts, and we get this question a lot, is that is this does this show up on a student's official record? And it does not. It does not show up on transcripts. It doesn't appear in those kind of places. This is a, an informal communication from an instructor to a student and does not appear in anywhere official. Uh, why did I mention that week seven being a kind of a key time? Um, with academic alerts, I like to describe them as they're always useful um, and they're always important, uh, but what we can do with an academic alert as a community of support around students can vary based on when we have that alert. And so uh, we've passed the first five weeks. Uh, we have found that when academic alerts come in you know, really early, there's potential for students to use that early feedback to seek help proactively and make significant adjustments to how they're approaching to a course or their overall strategy for academics. Where we are right now in weeks six to 10, uh, things shift a little bit. As you know, as students advance through a semester, the options that they might have available to them about adjustments they can make or how much they can improve can start to deteriorate. And so during weeks six to 10, we are still seeking and drawing in those academic alerts from the instructor community, but then students have to realize that it's time to set some priorities. You know, it's time to say, I gotta invest more energy and time and resources here and it could be the, at the expense of other courses, or more likely not, it's at the other expense of other kinds of engagements and involvements that they're trying to do. They have to start thinking about priorities in a different way and start to make difficult decisions about how they want to proceed in a term. Uh, when we look at our um, um, trends of when academic alerts tend to come in in any given term, we notice that uh, week six to 10 is when the rate of academic alerts starts to accelerate from the instructor community and actually peaks right at week 10. And if you know anything about the typical academic calendar in a given term, the reason why that happens, I think, is that that's the last week that students can withdraw from a course with a W. And so for us, we appreciate that activity towards the end of that 10 week period, but it also starts to put students into a little bit of a time pressure and bind. 
of do they want to make a plan about how to get through the end of the semester, recalibrate goals about how they can achieve in that course, or when we talk about difficult decisions, start working with their academic advisor to think about, you know, should I consider a withdrawal from this course? Should I consider that? And then what impact might that have on my uh, kind of agreements with the university around financial aid or housing. And so, um, especially when it comes to that full-time and part-time credit threshold. And so the stakes can raise a little bit for students when they think about the registration actions they might take around that week 10 period. Um, week 11 and 15, we still see academic alerts come in during that time. And here, this is where students just have to come to reality, come to grips with what might happen in this semester. They might not get the grade that they want to achieve. They might fail the course, um, or they might not uh, get a grade that, that, that counts for a, a core requirement. You know, those kind of things might be in reality at that point. And there, we want students to start just making good decisions with their advisors, with their faculty members about how to proceed and how to finish as strong as possible. But in the meantime, maintaining a sense of, I got to be real with myself about what this means. Academic alerts received in weeks 11 to 15 could lead to academic advising conversations. You didn't great, get the grade that you needed to progress in our degree plan. Um, therefore, we have to make adjustments about what happens in the next semester. So it's those kind of conversations that are happening there. And that's what an academic alert will allow us to do in those moments. Um, the last thing that I want to mention is... You know, what happens when students get an academic alert? Well, first and foremost, it's a notification to the student, and it's an, it's an exposure to the student of the network of support that's available to them. When you submit an academic alert through Eagle Service, um, it generates a personalized email to that student from the vantage point of the instructor. It has the comment that the instructor will leave about the performance in the course. It'll have a link to our academic coaching team, and has a link to the academic advisor contact information. Everything about this is personalized. And so it's not just a random link to an academic advising web page. It's the contact information for their academic advisor. So they could take immediate action to get in contact with the advisor if they want to. And then the comment, of course, is personalized by what the instructor wrote in the academic alert to the student. Whenever you generate an academic alert, um, the advising community and other parts of campus use a system called CRM Advise. Uh, kind of put simply, it's a note-taking and tracking system that academic advisors might use to keep uh, tabs on students. It also provides these colleagues a nice snapshot about what's going on about the student experience. And so when students get academic alerts for particular courses, that information is populated there. So if an advisor were to encounter a student, they would have that information right on hand to be able to address things as they were to come up more organically. You know, for us, we want academic alerts to be part of a process that um, is an important feedback loop that students, where they get information about how they're doing, they can make adjustments, make improvements, do as well as possible. And we want to get students out of situations where they can avoid academic warnings, they can avoid academic probation, and all ultimately just perform as well as possible uh, academically. Uh, one final note that I'll say on, on this screen is that that note from the instructor you know, sometimes instructors reach out to me or, or colleagues and say, hey, what should that note say? And my guidance in that moment is just the facts. Hey, student, you've earned a this. In order to um, uh, um, do well in this course, you're going to need a this on the next test. My idea, my best ideas for how you can improve is to take step A, B, and C. Kind of just the facts and some guidance is the way to go. There are some times in how much we care and kind of um, worry about students that uh, I see sometimes in these comments, um, some prescription about what the student might be experiencing or what they're going through or, or some uh, kind of more, more things less in description, but more in, in judgment. And I think that those kind of things can be left off. And I think just more direct, hey, I noticed this. If this continues, you're in the risk of this. The best way to move forward would be to do this would be a nice ABC, you know, in order to put a comment that a student can really use. And importantly, give people that care about that student uh, also, let's say an academic advisor or someone from the academic support community, it gives them a nice inroads to be able to work with the student based on that good guidance that's in that instructor note. Okay. All right. A couple things I want to show you just over the years. Um, you know, my role in this conversation today is that I'm just an invested stakeholder in the academic alert system. You know, between the advisor communities that I work with and the academic support communities that I work with, like we're very plugged into uh, being responsive to academic alerts. And so over the years, I've been curious about what the data has said about 
the prevalence of academic alerts and when we see them, when we don't, and et cetera. So I just want to run through a couple data slides here. You know, here's a, a chart looking or a table uh, looking over the, the last few years, fall 2020, all the way to spring 2023. Uh, the top line, the purple line, are academic alerts received, the count of uh, academic alerts received for degree-seeking undergraduate students. And you see that over the years, that total count has ranged from, you know, 900 to almost 1,200 students. Uh, there was a peak number collected in spring of 2022. Uh, that's not surprising to me because actually in fall 21, we had the largest first year cohort that we've had in, um, ever. And so I saw that natural increase there. And so that, that, that portends to what I would have expected. Uh, but nevertheless, you see that there was a 33% increase from spring 21 to spring 22. And then perhaps naturally, there's been a decrease from spring 22 to spring 23. And then the lower line, the pink reddish line is all other kinds of students. And you see the prevalence of academic alerts over the years there as well. Um, just an FYI, I guess nothing to really take away from this, but just to get a sense of you know, what we're dealing with as far as counts. And then the next slide I wanted to show is just something that I was curious about. You know, I asked myself the question, you know, how often is there an academic alert for a student that earns a D or an F in a course? And looking at the uh, among degree seeking undergraduate students, what I saw in the data is that over the past few years, that about 30% of, of, of um, the Ds and Fs in courses are also accompanied earlier in that semester with an academic alert. Now, I don't know for sure if this is too high or too low or just right, but if you told me to take a position, I would say it's maybe low, uh, you know, that you know, wouldn't we as a campus want the advising, the academic support community, the, the community of folks supporting students more generally to have more of a sense, more often a sense of when a student was struggling in a course to the extent that they might earn a D or F in the course. And so if I had to take a position, I'd say maybe too low. I don't know what it should be, um, but I think that this is an opportunity, especially for this subset of student and, and student on a pathway towards earning a DNF that, that maybe we can work together to, to raise the incidence of, uh, of, of academic alerts. Of course, um, what's not here is the counts of Ds and Fs uh, that we see, and um, we wanna be proactive. We wanna give students the pathways and the guidance and the instruction and the support to, to avoid this situation altogether. But if it's inevitable, and I, and I think it is, if we're just being realistic, you know, can we get more awareness early on that a student might be struggling? All right, and then last piece here is, is just uh, from my end is uh, just my thinking out loud about academic alerts in the process. As someone that's a member of the community, invested in trying to help students get the information needed to do well, where are we at and where could we be? Uh, the two uh, uh, squares, rectangles, rectangles that you see there, I think that's how we typically think about what academic alerts are on our campus. You know, faculty submits an academic alert, um, who gets the alert? It's the faculty member. They get the confirmation that, hey, you submitted this. They get CC'd on their own alert. The academic advisor gets CC'd. The registrar gets CC'd. And then the AU with the asterisk means that that information plugs into our systems, our relevant systems, like that advising system. And then depending on context, the advising and academic support may contact the student. Uh, and so it's not 100% that we'll reach out to the student based on an academic alert happening but it's frequently that that'll be the case. When might it not happen? Well, oftentimes academic advisors are already very aware and are in conversation with students about their academic struggle or, or issues with transition, things of that nature. And so, so as not to pile on, they can keep an ongoing conversation going versus freshly reaching out every time there's an academic alert. Now on the academic support side, um, academic uh, alerts are, are pretty frequent and often, and often they don't portend to failure, but they just portend to a small course correction that a student will naturally make. Uh, and that alert is often enough for them to kind of change behavior. But especially on the academic support side, we are conscious of when students are getting multiple academic alerts and we have process in place to engage students that receive more than one. And so that's when we get activated on the academic support side. Um, what are ways that we might reshape it? Well, one is that we would hope that students take initiative and connect with the faculty, advisor, academic support. You know, how do we get to that resolution? Because that's what we want. We want them to take some sort of action once they receive this academic alert. 
And then just an idea, and this is something that I've talked about over the summer and just into the semester is, you know, might it start earlier or even now? You know, faculty discuss with students and their classes that the academic alerts exist, they're normal. In fact, <laughs> thousands of, uh, that there are thousands of these that happen in, a, in an academic term. Um, if I ever notice that you're struggling in a course or if I don't see you or I'm worried about your attendance, this will uh, I'll get in contact with you personally, but I'm also going to submit this academic alert so I can get plugged in to what the university has to offer in support of students like you. And then what we described as the process happens, maybe with that lead, that socializing, socializing about what academic alerts are, normalizing it for students, the normal process happens. And then maybe we get that last thing, which is that students take action. They take initiative. Um, and then just to, being a good administrator, I wanted to get a few things on your radar, final thoughts and reminders. You know, one is that you submit academic alerts through the AU portal. Um, you can go to Eagle Service, academic alerts, and then click on academic alert. A lot of you, a lot of us go to Eagle Service straight to Eagle Service, just log in Eagle Service. Uh, there's an option there if you're a faculty member uh, to do an academic alert and you can click that, um, that, that button as well. Uh, we've passed the first two weeks, but you know students can add and drop courses without a W during that first two weeks. And that third bullet is the more relevant one. The last day to withdraw from a course or change a grade option is the end of the 10th week of classes. And so for fall 2023, this is Friday, November 3rd, you know, about four weeks from now. Okay. And then um, this next slide is, is more for when we distribute the presentation, you'll have it. Um, but I wanted to just share some resources. You know, if students have uh, are requesting or you think students could benefit with um, help with writing skills or quantitative concepts, there are two great resources there that students can explore. The Writing Center is appointment based, the Math and Stat Lab is drop in. If students want help with course content or subject matter, our peer assisted student support or PASS program offers one on one peer tutoring. It's a great place to start. I, I, I recommend um, uh, offering this resource to students. If students um, desire help with improving skills and learning academic strategies, then academic coaching, which is our professional uh, staff members whose whole craft is helping students become really great learners to improve their academic strategies, um, the link to those resources are, are, are there as well. Um, I want to raise awareness that for academic coaching, it's not meant to be an emergency response. And in fact, um, when you look at appointments, our appointments are usually about two weeks out. And so uh, encourage students to seek out academic coaching, but then know that uh, they might have to wait a week or two for an appointment and that's okay. Uh, it's never too late to, do, to build that sense of self uh, and, and build those skills. And so I um, encourage them to do that, but I just wanna set expectations about um, uh, when they could expect to get an appointment with academic coaching. And the last thing is that if they need help with adjusting their academic path or degree planning or registration, or just need a place to start, then the academic advising community is always a great resource. And so just encourage them to contact their advisor. And if they, they, they say, hey, who's my advisor? Say it's on your email. Uh, that's your advisor. Give them an email, reach out. And then I feel comfortable in a space like this. There's 21 of us in the room. Uh, maybe we'll get a few more eyeballs uh, uh, on the recorded session. If you get stuck, don't know how to give a resource or don't know the best idea of what to offer a student, feel free to reach out to me. You know, I'm happy to be that waypoint for a student, either directly or through you, to get them in the right spot to take that smart step. Um, if, if they show that initiative to want to take action, I'll, I'm all over it. And I think Ashley would be the same way. Michael would be the same way as well. We, we, we want to jump on that, um, that initiative and make sure that students get connected um, um, without any kind of friction. And so always consider us a resource as well. All right, I'll throw it back to you, Ashley. Thanks, Jim. E. Well, I'm going to throw it to the audience and, and ask if there are any questions. Folks, feel free to put it in the chat or come off mute, turn your camera on. Uh, we are here to answer anything that you might be thinking about. Robin. Yeah. Question. Um, in the very first um, graphic you showed, actually, there was a statement on there about uh, on the dimensions of retention. One that said reframing attrition or sense of attrition. Could you talk about what that means? Definitely. So it depends on what you're finding. Right. I think there are narratives, for example, especially if you follow national research right around first generation students struggling or Pell students that might be struggling. And the reality is we can't just attach to those national narratives. We have to actually dig deep every year across every cohort 
what are we seeing as it relates to some of the students that we're losing? And so it goes even beyond just me knowing, right? It's communicating as part of that coordinated care network to the university at large, what it is that we're seeing, right? What we need to be on the lookout for. And any time that we're thinking, especially during this time with budget constraints, right, of investing um, dollars into certain populations or programming or initiatives, you know, we really want to be thinking if our goal, which everyone in the space should know, is to get to 90% retention, then we have to be doing that in a thoughtful, coordinated way where we know it's going to make the biggest difference for the students that unfortunately are leaving the university. Um, and so you know this better than anybody, Robin, because we also study where they go, right, with national student clearinghouse data. And it just, it, it, it's a process in which we want to become regular, right? And then when we reframe each year what we're seeing or what we want to do about it, we're adding in voices like the faculty here in this space to be able to share their own individual experiences with students or students that they have within their courses. So please be a part of that narrative. <laughs> Got it. Thank you. Yes, yes, absolutely. Any other questions from the group here? I know Jimmy did a fabulous job walking through all the things. So it's okay if we leave you all like this because you also might be stewing on some of the information that we just shared as well. And so uh, one of the things that I wanted to remind this group about is that feedback element, right? We know that there is an opportunity to continue to enhance this process and we are committed to enhancing this process. So do not hesitate, just like Jimmy gave the invitation for you all to bring any, you know, certain cases or questions about this process, you know, to us and, and follow up, it, it, it's similar, right? With just the improvements, if you have ideas or feedback on really how to make this stronger, not just for you all, but also for our students, we are all ears. So thank you for your time. I'm hesitating because I just want to make sure and I'll ask one more, one more time. Are there any other questions from this group before we conclude for today? All right. Well, thank you all so much. We will, again, have the recording sent out. Um, and then also we'll include the slides that we prepared from today so that you all have access for it as well. Yes, Steve. All right. Perfect. I answered that question. All right, everyone. Take care. Have a great day and a great rest of your semester. Same to you. Thank you very much. Take care. Thank you. Take care. Don't forget Bye -bye. to take the survey. There's a survey there as well. So if you do have the time, please take the survey. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate it. All right, everybody. Bye-bye.